coming on the air with millions of people under flood alerts with another round of dangerous storms getting ready to slam the Pacific coast. The new video we're getting just now of the damage as San Francisco is getting hit with record rain. We're live on the ground. Plus, new details on an apparently kind of irritated President Biden over those classified documents found at his home. Why our sources say he's getting frustrated about what he sees as sloppiness. Plus, a plea from Iran as an American prisoner there starts a hunger strike. He's calling his detention soul-crushing and wants the Biden administration to do something. The question is, what can they do? We're getting into it. Plus, a college gymnastics superstar getting a ton of extra security with fans swamping her meets. How she's changing the NCAA as this whole thing spotlights the harassment the gymnasts can face. And in tonight's backstory, we peel back the curtain on what it's been like to cover the recovery of Damar Hamlin with a veteran on the Buffalo Bills beat. All the behind the scenes stuff you wanted to know, but didn't think to ask later in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight we'll take you to start on the West Coast with another storm system brewing in California. Yes, if it's deja vu, it is another storm system in California. You've got this state getting more rain, more wind, millions of people under these flood alerts in the central part of the state. You've got officials in the Bay Area, places like Santa Clara County, Berkeley Hills, telling people, get ready to leave your home, right? Be ready for that evacuation to come out because of the potential for flooding and landslides. The governor of the state signed an executive order today to help some of the places that have been most affected here, Santa Cruz, Sacramento County. Look at your screen. This is all the damage that was left behind there. In San Francisco, rain overnight pushed the city's airport to pass its yearly water total with eight months to go. So think about that. They have eight months left. They've already gotten more rain than they have in the previous years already. 20 inches. They measure the year, by the way, from October to September. Further south, you have flooding, too. San Diego lifeguards were out today rescuing people. Look at these pictures. One woman's car got stuck in the water. They went out. They tried to get her out. Crews across the state are still trying to get power back on for people. 36,000 of them are spending the day in the dark. Over the next few days, this storm in California will make its way from one coast to another. Look at it. Across the Rockies, snow, Midwest, severe weather down south, watches starting to go into effect tomorrow from Denver to Omaha. Dana Griffin is on the ground in Capitola, California. Bill Karens has the forecast for us. Let's start with Dana. And Dana, you are in one of the spots, Capitola, Santa Cruz County, that has been hardest hit by these storms. Talk about the concern over falling trees, mudslides, the ground just being loose and dangerous because it's so saturated. That's right, Holly. You know, most of that rain came in this morning. Right now, the sun is out. It's starting to dry out. But the big concern that officials have been warning residents about is that saturated ground, which means that there could be a potential for fallen trees and mudslides. We actually saw a gigantic one yesterday near Highway 9 in Santa Cruz. It's closed down for weeks and will be for, for some time because officials say that so much mud and heavy debris has fallen onto that road that they believe the ground underneath is compromised. So it's a situation where you may not see rain falling right now, but that does not mean that the threat, Hallie, is over. We saw the beach town of Capitola. Dana, we saw Capitola get crushed by some of the storms. This is video of what it looked like a couple weeks ago. How are they thinking about recovery? Like, how are they thinking about rebuilding at this point? Well, I can tell you that some of the local businesses near the beach are already starting that cleanup process. We saw a crew that was hauling out debris. Some of the floorboards have been torn up, windows busted. And part of the Capitola wharf behind me, part of that came loose and into chunks and a chunk of that is actually sitting in the middle of one of the restaurants uh, here to my left so it's going to be a process they are now trying to figure out what to do next we actually spoke with one of those business owners who talked about what these past couple of weeks have been like for him listen we're not wiped off the map you know we're still here we took a beating but you know we, we get back up and we're going to keep fighting and that's kind of the sentiment that you have across the region. Everyone just wanting to feel that resiliency to try to get back to normal. But that's going to take several weeks, months, maybe even years, Hallie. Sure will. Dana Griffin, thank you for being there for us. Appreciate it. Let me bring in Bill Karens now. So, Bill, like you saw it with Dana's live shot there, a lull, right? A bit of a break in the storm. We've been seeing that like intermittently <laughs> here and yeah. there. But the bigger issue is like, OK, Love, love it. Love to see 30 minutes of sun or at least no rain. But the problem is the other 23 and a half hours in the day. 
And this break is going to last. The next one, you know, they're going to have showers this afternoon, this evening, as you said, and then the next round will come in after that. So they have been spacing it out enough that we haven't had the extreme flooding like we had, you know, last week, you know, a week ago today, actually, by the way. So we still have 7 million people that are under flood watches because the ground is so saturated, rivers are already high. We still have a couple areas that are still having river flooding ongoing. But we haven't seen really significant troublesome mudslides and debris flows. I know around Los Angeles this morning there was a little mud flow. It blocked one lane of a highway. We showed you the rescue in San Diego. The high winds, unfortunately, a tree fell on someone and uh, we're on Golden State, uh, Golden Gate Park there in San Francisco, and that took a life. So there is still weather that it's affecting people, but it's not as big and bad as the other storms. So the storm this morning, the rain has cleared all of Southern California, and now just showery type weather in Central California. Still some very heavy snow to the north. And I mentioned there's one more storm. This is going to be a Wednesday coming from Northern California. California. It's going to be head towards San Francisco. It looks like Wednesday night. The good thing about this, it's fast moving, so you can't get those high rainfall totals, and it should be completely gone and kicking through California by the time we get to Thursday night. So one more storm will come through, and I only think minor problems with that one. Talk about where people need to be worried as this system moves across the country. You've laid out some of it here. We talked about the South yet again, maybe getting yeah. hammered, the Midwest, the Rockies. Yeah, so this is the storm that hit California today. Tomorrow it travels through the Four Corner region. And then by the time we get to Tuesday night, heavy snow in areas like Denver. And then on Wednesday, very heavy snow possible from Omaha, heading up through Iowa, the Quad Cities, eventually towards Milwaukee. But this is what I don't want to see. Another strong cold front into warm, humid air. That's going to mean the chance for more severe weather. This hopefully will not be a big tornado outbreak like last Thursday. But isolated tornadoes are possible. East Texas, almost all of Louisiana, southern Arkansas. Arkansas heading into Mississippi, wind gusts likely too. And of course, the snow side of this, it's not going to be any picnic in Denver, six to 10 inches by, by Wednesday evening. Wednesday morning's commute will be very difficult. I'm sure kids will have school canceled there in the Denver area, and then this will move through the plains. So the snowfall totals, say Denver about six to nine, Omaha should be around six inches, and then all of Wisconsin and southern Minnesota getting covered in snow. We haven't talked a lot about snow, Hallie, lately. It's all about the West Coast. I know. Winter will return, I promise you that. Super weird because it's about 60 degrees in D.C. today and like we're barely in a jacket. Yep. And here it is in January. We'll see. Bill, thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate it. Speaking of what's happening in Washington, besides the mild weather, you've got the White House clapping back today at House Republicans who want to dig into President Biden's handling of classified documents. In a statement, in part, one spokesperson is saying, hey, these members of the GOP have no credibility. Their demands should be met with skepticism and they should face questions about why they're politicizing the issue. After the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, Republican James Comer, asked for visitor logs from the president's home in Delaware. That's after a third batch of classified documents was found in a room near the garage, according to a statement by the president's personal counsel this weekend. The White House and Secret Service both telling NBC News today that those logs don't exist, at least for the home. Over on the Hill today this afternoon, reporters managed to catch up with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. He's in the office on this holiday Monday, asking him, hey, what does the timeline for a House investigation look like? I think we want to collect more of the data, more of the information. Are these all the documents? Are there more out there? I mean, um, I know the White House tried to say it was all cleared up on Thursday. Now that we find there's more documents, I think there's a lot of questions that uh, continue to raise, and we want to get all the information possible. President Biden, for his part, back at the White House today, not answering questions, as three people familiar with the matter tell NBC News he's pretty irritated about this whole backlash. Joining me now is NBC White House correspondent Carol Lee. And Carol, um, talk to me a little bit about the politics piece of this, because today you, you saw the White House come out and basically say, hey, Republicans, here you are trying to say you care about President Biden's classified document situation. Where were you when Donald Trump was doing the same thing? They're trying to say this is hypocritical here. But we know that the president is not really thrilled with how this has been handled. What else do we know? Right. We know that the president is upset about the way that his aides ha have handled this. He's also upset and irritated with possible aides who worked for him when he was VP, vice president, who may have inadvertently packed some of these documents in there. So there's like frustration all around in terms of how the president feels about this. Also feels like, Hallie, he's been cooperating. He's 
done the right thing, quote unquote, in the words of the White House, and yet still wound up with a special counsel and is still under all of this scrutiny, with the concern being that Americans are going to just conflate the situation that's happening with former President Trump and the situation that's happening with President Biden. And the White House argues that these are dramatically different instances. So what you're seeing really is for the first time is the White House taking the gloves off and hitting back at Republicans who've been really making a lot of hay about this since this first came to light a week ago, and specifically on this issue of demanding visitor logs at the president's private residence. They're saying that this is something that they're not asking for, and they're not Republicans of former President Trump's visitor who was visiting at his residence in Mar-a-Lago when there were classified documents stored there that should not have been. They're saying, they're arguing, the White House is arguing that there's a double standard playing out here. At the same time, you hear Republicans saying there's a double standard playing out here. So there's a lot of noise and a lot of politics in, in all of this. But some of those questions that Republicans are asking are ones that the special counsel and potentially the intelligence community are going to want answers to, which is, is there any risk? Who had access right. to these documents? And was there any exposure in terms of U.S. national security? Well, let me play what the aforementioned Republican member of Congress, House Oversight Chair James Comer, said just late today over on Fox News on cable about the White House saying that they don't have those logs that we were talking about. Here it is. What are you going to do to get your hands on that information? Well, we wonder if the Secret Service had records. Now, that's our next question, because uh, he still had Secret Service protection. Mm -hmm. And you would assume that the Secret Service would vet people that would be allowed on the premise of the dwelling for the president of the United States. So, uh, you know, there are other areas we're going to look. But, Carol, the Secret Service doesn't keep logs either, right? And at Mar-a-Lago, it's different because the Trump org, like Donald Trump's own, not that, you know, his own people, basically, right? right. Mar-a-Lago, Trump Tower, they're the ones who keep track of themselves. It's kind of a moving target on what gets logged and what doesn't. Right. And there, there's a couple things going on here. First of all, when the vice president leaves the White House, they don't have Secret Service for the entirety. It's not like right. the president of their time. It's about six, I think it's six months of Secret Service protection. So there's a whole window in which President Biden didn't have Secret Service protection. And even if the Secret Service did keep those logs, which they don't, that they wouldn't be able to account for. So there's that gap. The White House is not under any legal obligation to keep visitor logs, but the Biden administration has decided to basically put forward some of the people that come into the White House. The bottom line here, Hallie, is there's a lot of noise going on here. And I think what the congressman is asking for is something that he probably knows doesn't really exist either. Carol Lee, live for us outside the White House. Carol, thank you for that. This afternoon, as we talk about the Biden administration, you've also heard the White House say they're committed to securing the freedom of Sia Maknamazi a U.S. citizen, an American, who's been in an Iranian prison for seven years and today started a hunger strike in protest. A National Security Council spokesperson adding they're working tirelessly to bring him home from prison. In a statement, Namazi says he's starting today's hunger strike to mark the year since he was left out of a prisoner swap in 2016. He writes, the U.S. government promised my family to have me safely home within weeks, yet seven years and two presidents later, I remain caged. Iranian authorities had sentenced Namazi to 10 years for what they describe as collaborating with a hostile foreign uh, government. Emily Akeda joins us now. And Emily, you know, the U.S. says they're committed to bringing him home. Talk us through why he's been there so long in the first place. And he's been there, Hallie, in the notorious Evin prison since 2015. So he was arrested there in 2015 while on a business trip in Iran and under the charges, as you mentioned, of collaboration with a hostile foreign government. Charges the U.S. government and the U.N. have called baseless and in violation with international law. I should also know uh, Iran says uh, denying those claims. But we've seen various prisoner swaps play out since then, including one shortly after the Iran nuclear deal was signed, uh, involving bringing home multiple people, multiple Americans, including a pastor, a Marine veteran, a journalist. But Namazi was not part of that deal. Namazi says that uh, Iran had told the U.S. government he, too, would be able to be freed within weeks. That never came to fruition. The National Security Council says that uh, they're using Americans as political leverage, calling it outrageous, Hallie. 
Um, you think about this in the broader U uh, context here of the government managing to get Brittany Griner out of prison in Russia, Trevor Reed out of prison in Russia. W what can a hunger strike do here? Right? What is the impact here? Because you have, for example, even just a couple of months ago, Secretary of State Tony Blinken saying that they are working on every unjustly detained American every day, including Namazi. Yeah, Hallie, you know, it's hard to say, but you think about a Brittany Griner situation, and I remember U.S. officials telling her teammates, her family, to keep her imprisonment top of mind, top of conversation. And so it appears that this is what Namazi is doing, trying to renew the spotlight, the spotlight on his yeah. case. Exactly. And so, you know, in speaking with legal expert Danny Savalas, I think it's worth pointing out, this is a hard hill to climb, it, as it was for even someone with widespread name recognition, a professional athlete. Uh, as you mentioned, we know that the uh, National Security Advisor has met with with uh, Namazi's family today, releasing a statement that reads in part a spokesperson with that council saying Iran's wrongful detention of U.S. citizens for use as political leverage is outrageous. Our priority is bringing all our wrongfully detained citizens home safely and as soon as possible and resolving the cases of missing and abducted U.S. citizens, Hallie. So only time will tell. We'll see if this furthers that conversation. Emily Akeda, thank you very much for that reporting. Appreciate it. We're learning later this week, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen will have her first in-person meeting with top finance officials from China. It'll be in Switzerland, but not at Davos, right, that annual big economic summit. The meeting's going to be a bit of a follow-up to November when President Biden and President Xi Jinping met in Bali, with both agreeing to have their senior sort of officials, right-hand men and women, talk more with each other to try to get economic tensions under control. At Davos, by the way, it's now back for the first time in three years after COVID. CEOs, world leaders, members of Congress, et cetera, getting together to talk about stuff like climate change, the war in Ukraine, the sort of global economic slowdown that's happening. Kier Simmons is there, joins me now from the Swiss Alps, uh, a lovely little town not too far from Davos, Kier. Let me start with Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, because she has a lot on her plate. She just warned that the U.S. is going to hit our debt ceiling in a matter of three days. That's going to be a crisis that Congress is going to have maybe four or five months to handle. She's got to deal with economic tensions with China, mm -hmm. the possibility of a global slowdown as it relates to where the economy is. How, how does this all come? To, boy, that sounds like a job I don't want to have. You know what I mean? Right. It's really challenging. She's got it on all sides, hasn't she really? I mean, you mentioned this domestic crisis. I mean, let's put it this way. Has Kevin McCarthy done a deal with a minority of House Republicans, which could lead to a U.S. fiscal crunch and that would therefore lead to an economic crisis around the world? That's one issue. Meanwhile, she's dealing with the China issue. Now, that meeting with the deputy premier of China, now that's been quickly put together. That that suggests some indication, Hallie, that there is some conversations that things are getting a little easier between the U.S. and China. But, of course, they have been, particularly in terms of trade, very, very difficult. She then goes on to Africa, and there her job is uh, to persuade African countries that America is on their side the way that China has been trying to do that, the way that Russia has been trying to do that in some parts of Africa. So, so yeah, uh, Janet Yellen um, faces a lot of challenges in 2023. Uh, I guess we all do with our families in 2023, right? But, um, hey, uh, who would want to be the Treasury Secretary? <laughs> That's for sure. Well, what's interesting here is that a lot of big leaders are not going to be at Davos this year. Um, President Biden, for example, yeah. President Xi, Emmanuel Macron, Rishi Sunak are not going. I wonder how much of that here, based on your reporting, if you can speak to this, has to do with the optics of Davos being so elitist. I mean, that's what it is. You and I have both been there. It's like posh, you know, it's it's it is. It, does, does that play into this? Like people don't want to be seen, you know, glamming it up around yeah. Davos while people back home are dealing with high inflation, et cetera. Yeah, it's too posh for you or me, my friend. I mean, I say no, that with love, right? For me, right? for sure, you know, it's, it's, I don't know about is, you, my uh, posh friend. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I tell you, it is, it, it is millionaires, it is uh, CEOs, it is top political leaders. L listen, the optics for Davos have always been difficult. There's always been this debate. I mean, how does it look to be flying in a private jet and talking about climate change? On the other hand, OK, maybe world leaders should be having those conversations, and if they have to have them in the Swiss Alps, hmm. OK. But you're, you're absolutely right. Just the British Prime Minister, for example, uh, not here because the UK is facing a recession. You don't want to be seen 
hobnobbing with rich and, and famous and, 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 as you say, posh people uh, when uh, your voters are struggling. And I think that's true for many, for many countries, uh, many leaders uh, who would be here uh, on, on other occasions. That doesn't mean the discussion isn't important, but the optics are difficult. That's a great point. Keir Simmons, um, I look forward to seeing more of your reporting throughout the week. Uh, appreciate it. After 30 years on the run, Italy's most wanted mafia boss is behind bars. Matteo Messina Denaro ordered some of the nation's most horrific killings and reportedly bragged that he could fill up a cemetery with his victims. He's 60 years old and the alleged leader of the notorious Cosa Nostra organized crime group. He's been convicted of dozens of murders and now faces multiple life sentences, including for bombings in 1992 that killed anti-mafia prosecutors. Italian police captured him at a private clinic in Sicily where he was treat being treated for some kind of a medical issue. Kelly Cobier joins us now. Kelly, it is an extraordinary capture. What else do we know about not just the arrest, but how police even tracked this guy down in the first place? Yeah, that's right, Hallie. They've been trying to track him down, as you said, for 30 years now. But today, prosecutors said what actually led them to him was a health issue, a health issue that forced him out into the open. They said that they had recently learned that he was ill. They didn't specify what kind of issue he was having, but there was a specific treatment and only certain places that offered that treatment. So they started narrowing down the clinics, the places where he might receive that treatment. They looked at the patients list and out of a system of just um, uh, culling the list, they thought that they had their man. This particular person going to the clinic under an alias had made an appointment for this morning, and about 100 police officers were there on this raid uh, ready to greet him. They said that he did not resist. He admitted that he was, in fact, the man they were looking for. They said he didn't look like a broken man. He appeared to be healthy, well-groomed, hmm. and was even sporting a 36 seven thousand dollar watch hallie oh man i mean this is a guy considered kind of the last godfather right of the sicilian mafia what what happens now like he was sentenced in absentia for the killings the murders of those prosecutors we mentioned are those convictions going to be upheld does he go straight to prison for multiple life sentences or does he have to go to trial no, those still stand, Hallie. So he has a couple of life sentences to serve out. He will be serving time in prison. But first, prosecutors want to know more. They've got uh, this very valuable asset now in their hands. They, he has apparently been taken to a secret location where he's being questioned. They'll want names. They'll want uh, names of people who are still in Cosa Nostra. They'll want uh, information, details on past alleged crimes uh, by this organization. The question the question is, will this man who has been on the run for 30 years break the code of silence and give them what they want after all this time? Hallie. This is the, it feels like we've been reporting on and, and hearing about other high profile captures of mafia bosses in, in the sort of recent days and months. That's right, actually. just. Last year, uh, another big uh, mafia boss from another very powerful uh, organized crime operation was arrested in Brazil uh, after being on the run for 28 years. This is something that the Italian authorities have really focused, honed in on. And this arrest in particular uh, of Messina... Uh, uh, of Messina is, no, yeah. is really a sort of a psychological boost, not just to, to the Italian authorities, but also to the people in Sicily and elsewhere who, who um, you know, for, for decades had the impression that the mafia was yeah. unbreakable. This was sort of that, uh, that, that blow, as the Italian prime minister put it, uh, to the mafia, really a psychological blow, also a, a, an organizational blow uh, to the Cosa Nostra, which is not as powerful as it once was, but still operates in Sicily. Kelly Kobiea, thank you very much. Great reporting. It's fascinating. Appreciate it. Coming up, some stunning new video from a deadly plane crash in Nepal. What officials there are saying about what went wrong and what's next in this investigation. Plus, maybe some more trouble for Congressman George Santos, who he's reportedly been linked to. And what House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is saying about the whole thing today, next. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy today telling reporters on Capitol Hill that he'd always had a few questions about New York Republican Congressman George Santos's resume. A big part of that resume we now know was made up, invented. 
as the congressman's business dealings are under real scrutiny tonight. A new report found Santos has deeper financial ties than people previously thought to the cousin of a U.S. sanctioned Russian oligarch, according to the Washington Post. And if you're like, okay, Hal, why does this matter? Why do I care? Remember, Santos not only lied on his resume about where he worked and where he went to school or running for office, he's also being investigated by federal authorities for campaign finance crimes, the potential of those. Republican House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer said Santos is going to be removed from Congress if it turns out that he did break any campaign finance-related laws. That's what he would hope to do, at least. I want to bring in Ali Vitale. So let's talk about this Post reporting here, that this cousin of the Russian oligarch donated nearly $6,000 to Santos's campaign committee, thousands more to committees linked to him. The reason, right, we don't know much more beyond that, and we should say NBC News has not independently confirmed that. The, the even mere suggestion of this could be problematic for the congressman because of these campaign finance questions, right? Yeah, exactly. And because this is someone who has ties, of course, to a currently sanctioned Russian oligarch. But it all breeds the question of where his money was coming from during that campaign. For example, the fact that he loaned his own campaign several hundreds of thousands of dollars when it's not clear how he was able to do that. Now we're getting more of a sense from this Washington Post reporting about where money was coming from, not just into his official campaign, but into other political campaign committees that were related related to him. So this is just one of the new ties that we're hearing about. But you can bet all of it is something that the Federal Election Commission is digging into as people have urged them, hey, check out where this guy's campaign cash was coming from because it's really shady. And this is yet another piece to that. It is part of the drip, drip, drip of Santos stories that seems to come out every yeah. like 48 to 72 hours here, right? Um, one of those stories having been that one of his aides allegedly impersonated an aide to House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, which the speaker talked yeah. about today, basically said, like, I didn't know about it until after it happened, essentially. I mean, there's it, how sustainable is this, Allie, right? Like, unless the spigot dries up, there's going to be stuff about George Santos for who knows how long. It does really seem that way, right? I mean, you and I were talking about this earlier. Really, it is. Every few days, we get a new piece of information that sort of boggles the mind. And I think what was striking today is the fact that you have Speaker McCarthy saying that he always had a few questions about Santos's resume. I mean, I have some follow-ups to that that I hope we get the chance to ask. But then also the fact that this is something that even within McCarthy's ranks, that someone on the Santos campaign was impersonating McCarthy's chief of staff on the phone to donors. McCarthy said that's something that he spoke to Santos about probably after because he says he only learned about it after. But I think the most important thing here is the way that McCarthy was talking to reporters today. The first question he got was on the Biden documents. The next few questions he got were on George Santos. And I think it's really indicative of the push and pull that Republicans are going to have to play for as long as Santos remains within their ranks, which is they're trying to be aggressive, move on oversight, move on their agenda. And then they've also got this drama with in their own ranks that they're probably at some point going to have to deal with or just keep contending with it. Ali Vitale, it's a good point. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sure you'll keep us updated if there is more to come on that front. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, in an NBC News exclusive, it looks like Ohio's Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown will get a new Republican challenger in a very important 2024 race. Republican Matt Dolan plans to launch another run for Senate sometime this week, according to a voicemail obtained by NBC News. Dolan is a state senator whose family owns the Cleveland Guardians baseball team. No comment from a Dolan rep today, but we do know Senator Brown has said he does plan to run for a fourth term next year. Number two, police in California investigating the shooting deaths of six people, including a teenage mom and her six-month-old baby. Officers were called to the scene after shots were reported early this morning. Police say they think a family was targeted and that this might be linked to gang activity. Number three, Nepal declaring a national day of mourning today after a plane crash killed at least 69 people. We're now seeing some images of the plane just moments before it went down. And this disturbing video shot by a passenger right before the crash happened. You just saw it there. Officials say the plane's cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorder have been recovered intact. French investigators are on their way to help out. Number four, the Australian Open. Kicking off today with a big disappointment for one of the country's big stars, Australian tennis player Nick Kyrgios, pulling out of the tournament because of a knee injury even before his first match. 
He was the runner-up to Novak Djokovic in last year's Wimbledon tournament. Djokovic is expected to play tomorrow in the Open. Number five teams set off from Spain this weekend on the first leg of an around-the-world sailing competition, the Ocean Race. They won't even cross the finish line until this summer after stops in South Africa, Brazil, the U.S., and Europe. LSU women's gymnastics coming off a tough loss in its home opener, losing by less than a point to number one Oklahoma. But there was something a little bit unusual at today's meet, something out of the ordinary, extra security. Why was there extra security? Because of rowdy fans there to see this woman, Olivia Dunn, a superstar in her sport, having earned all American honors for athletics and academics. But she's also built a brand away from the mat with nearly 7 million followers on TikTok. Yes, 7 million, another 3 million on Instagram, combined for the most in the NCAA. That has helped make her one of the most valuable athletes in all of college sports. But that fame has led to some moments, some scenes like this. Watch. Those screaming boys outside LSU's meet against the University of Utah last week. The Tigers head coach, Jay Clark, called it mob-like, telling ESPN he's going to add more security outside the team's bus on the road now, too. Corey Robinson of NBC Sports joins us now. The irony of all this is Dunn hasn't even competed yet this year because she's been hurt. She posted today a picture with a boot on her foot, and yet all of these fans are still showing up in a really intense way. Walk us through it and what she's been saying. Yeah, it's such an interesting concept, Hallie, this idea well, in, in the NIL marketplace, we have bona fide celebrities. It's almost like what you, th you, what you see in, you know, like boy band type of, you know, fan craziness. But we're seeing this translate not only to college football QBs or to college basketball stars, but also to traditionally non-revenue generating sports and Olympic sports, which we don't necessarily see in our country, you know, other than the Olympic cycle. Once every four years, we see Simone Biles and everyone's kind of crazed. This is so kind of strange to us because we're seeing it now on a regular basis with Suni Lee and now with Olivia Dunn. So Olivia Dunn went to Twitter after last week's uh, meet and said, Look, I know you're, un you're excited to, you know, support me and we appreciate the love, but please be respectful. The, the issue with the mob mentality that we've seen, and Coach Jay Clark hit around the head, this is not normal fan behavior. This is mob-like. It's disrupting the meat. It's disrupting the other, the other competitors as they try to do their routines, and that is not, that's not okay. That's not acceptable. Yeah. I mean, you're seeing it, Corey, when you look at these. I said, boys, men, right, presumably. We don't know their ages, but they're there to look for her. And you, you hit on something interesting when you talked about NAL, and I want to explain that. This new name, image, likeness rule coming out of the NCAA. She's, she's used that to create some deals. Um, Forever 21, Grubhub, American Eagle, for example. She's worth an estimated $2.5 million. That's the most among any female athlete, the sixth most overall among all college athletes of either gender. In a lot of ways, she is, to your point, Corey, one of the big faces of the way that college sports is changing here. Yeah, absolutely, Hallie. You have to understand, too, like, these sports that necessarily we don't watch every day. You know, I don't know if you and your friends are watching gymnastics. I do gymnastics. not watch gymnastics every day, candidly, Corey. That's not, you know, I don't watch any sport every day. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, so it's, it's one of those Olympic kind of sports where every four years you have that moment, right? So I understand that there may not, you know, be people who aren't necessarily aware of the etiquette of the rules of the sport. You know, that takes time to learn. But this, once again, is not that. This is more mob-like. So when you're talking about the NCAA um, name, image, and likeness that you just mentioned, being able to make over $2 million a year, you know, she's one of the highest earners, all the, the big-time deals that you mentioned, this is no longer just, okay, you know, we're going to go do a meet. Now you have to start approaching it with the same security detail that you would give Nick Saban's Alabama football team or Kirby Smart's Georgia football team. Right. You know, these, these are, like I said, bona fide celebrities, superstars, and you have to, and all the smaller sports that historically have never really had to deal with this, because um, most people, especially in gymnastics, you would have to make the decision. Do I want to go uh, capitalize on this fame and go make money, or do I want to go back to college? Now you can do both. So they're going to have to, uh, it's really, the, the onus is on the schools to, to bring that security detail like they would have a big time celebrity come into campus every right. time they travel. Um, no, you're right. I mean, it's going to be a huge, it, it feels like we're in the middle of a sea change now for college sports, not just for the big stuff. I mean, you know, former Notre Dame, et cetera, but, but just in all of these sports in general, Corey.
Yeah, and, and I think you're right. When you're talking about the, the face of college sports, she does really kind of fit that mold pretty well, right? And that's, the thing that's so fascinating, Hallie, and this is just something that to, you said that she's the only one in the top ten for, for women. Uh, women in NIL have been pressured to sexualize. Uh, they're, they're like, it's super hypersexual in the way that they think about like NIL marketing and deals and how you make money as opposed to their male counterparts. This is something that really tinges that, that lens that we were talking about before with Coach Jake Clark's comments, mob-like leading to what? There is a real right. issue safety around young women, 18 to 22 year old sure. women in this space. So that's something to really look forward to as far as like, if you're a, if you're a company, do not do this. Do not hypersexualize your, your marketing and make sure that as a university you protect your student athletes. Such a smart point. Corey Robinson from NBC Sports. Great to see you. Thank you so much. So tonight we want to bring you a story about how a message in a bottle was found decades after it was thrown off the coast of Florida. A couple of teachers there found it in a lagoon as they were cleaning up after Hurricane Nicole. And look at this. This was the note inside that this little girl and her family managed to pry out of that bottle, written by a guy named Troy Heller nearly 40 years ago. Watch. Do you remember what the note said, what you put on the message? Well, I did remember, you know, I remember that I wrote, you know, whoever finds this, you know, uh, call me or write to me. So the Carmax family, who ended up trying to find it, wanted to write him, wanted to call him, but all they had was a name, a number, and Google. So after some serious sleuthing, they managed to, they think, track down the right guy, sent their own message by text, not bottle, and reached out. Watch. We carefully tried taking the top of the bottle off and getting it out without damaging the bottle. When we opened the message, um, we were happy and... Um, the message had Troy's phone number and house address, and it was really exciting. To find out what happened next, you can watch my full story tonight on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, 6.30 Eastern, wherever you watch your local NBC. When we come back, a YouTuber with millions of followers now talking about the sexual misconduct allegations against him. What he said in this more than four-minute long video that's getting a lot of attention. Next. An independent journalist and star of a new HBO documentary, Andrew Callahan, now personally apologizing over allegations of sexual coercion and assault, saying he has some serious work to do on himself. Earlier this month, a woman named Caroline Elise posted on TikTok saying she let Callahan stay at her house back in 2021 and allegedly made it very clear that they wouldn't hook up. What ended up happening, according to her, is that he wore her down until she gave him consent to have sex. A few days after that post, another woman came forward accusing Callahan of touching her without consent back in 2016. Callahan says when it came to consent, he never overstepped that line, in his words. Vaughn Hillier joins us now with more. And Vaughn, walk us through these allegations, because um, Elise's friend actually shared what happened to her back in spring of 2021 as a warning to other women, according to the Rolling Stone. But this whole thing didn't really become a, a big deal until recently as Callahan got more popular, right? Right, Hallie. Callahan has risen in prominence. This latest January 6th documentary on HBO Max only heightened its profile. And that first allegation made in the TikTok video by Caroline Elise was posted actually just days after the release of that documentary. She alleged that Callahan got into her bed and kept pushing her until she agreed to do, quote, do things I wasn't proud of. A second woman who goes by Dana did not respond to NBC News requests for comment, but alleged online that she and Callahan had previously had consensual sex, but that at a later time, she alleged he touched her inner thigh, kissed her neck, and tried to put his hand down her pants without her consent, Hallie. You know, in his apology, Callahan said he was sorry for what he described as sex pest behavior. Says he's always taken no for an answer, but wants to have a more nuanced and important conversation, he says, about power dynamics and coercion and the idea of persistence, right? This is a guy who's a pretty big influencer online and then went on to make a big deal with some big companies for this doc. Right, Hallie, this is a, a difficult situation, and one that Callahan, in that four-minute video he posted online, says he's now intending on addressing and talking, res taking responsibility for. He says he's going to start therapy sessions immediately, as well as entering Alcoholics Anonymous program, saying he believes alcohol was at least a, quote, contributing factor to my poor decision-making. And Callahan's lawyer is saying in a statement that you'll see, quote, Andrew is devastated that he is being accused of any type of physical or mental coercion against anyone. Conversations 
conversations about pressure and consent are extremely important, and Andrew wants to have these conversations so he can continue to learn and grow. Hallie, it's important to also note, though, that Callahan continues to insist that he never crossed the line, quote, crossed the line when it turned in terms of uh, consent on uh, when, when it pertains to these two women. Hallie. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you very much for that reporting. Coming up, a Colorado library closed. Now the second one in weeks because of a very certain substance. What officials say it's contaminated with later on in the local. Time now to get our backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight we're talking about Damar Hamlin. And not gonna lie, he's pretty hyped today. Now that his bills are moving on in the playoffs in the NFL. Obviously, the safety couldn't be there in person for the Buffalo's team's nail-biting 34-30 win over the Dolphins. But he did tweet a lot throughout the game, including that emoji hand, hand hearts, whatever you call it, hearts, heart-shaped hands. It's become such a fixture of his recovery, a recovery that truly, truly is remarkable, right? Look at this timeline. Every little detail we learned since that hit that stunned the nation on Monday Night Football, the slow drip drip of updates we got when we found out Hamlin could ask questions like whether they won the game, even his return to the Bills practice facility. Somebody who's seen it all up close, including the heart hands emoji, is Jay Skirsky, the Bills beat reporter for the Buffalo News. Jay, I'm so glad you have a, you're here with us. You know, this, this segment, it really is about pulling back the curtain. How do you do the reporting that you do? You've covered the Bills for a long time. I know, I mean, I, we've never talked about this. I cannot imagine you ever thought you'd see anything like what you saw that Monday Night Football game. Um, what was it like in the moments that that happened as you sort of jumped into trying to report out this horrific story? Yeah, you you realized quite quickly that this was so, something so much different than what we're accustomed to covering. And, you know, the sad reality of covering life in the NFL is that you deal with a lot of injuries. They happen every single week. So we're, we're used to be, you know, to players being down on the field, to sometimes being seriously hurt. And honestly, every time it happens, you know, the, the game goes on. You know, sometimes players even leave the field in ambulances and the game goes on. This time, however, it was clear rather immediately that this was something far different. And the, and the first thing that stood out to me was the, the reactions from DeMar Hamlin's teammates. I, I could tell by watching their faces that this was something else. This was something that they hadn't seen before. And then, you know, for the 10 minutes or so that he was down, I, I think the, the one thing that will stick with me probably for the rest of my life, certainly uh, the rest of my career was, actually seeing through binoculars in the press box CPR being performed. That was something that I had never seen, of course, on a football field and, and quite right. frankly, never hoped to see again. And you also then had to report out, right? I mean, the idea of, sure, we know ACLs, torn ACLs, you know what I mean? We know those kinds of injuries that players get. This was something so different out of the scope of what we might typically see. Um, and it was such a huge effort by you and, and the paper and the people who were covering this to try to break this down so people could understand there was such high interest in this. That's absolutely right. And it was, and your, the, the interest level is something that was so much different than, again, a typical injury. And so, right, in the, in the minutes and in the uh, maybe hour or so after the fact, it's, okay, where is he going? What is his immediate condition? Let's try to answer those questions as fastly and as accurately, of course, as we can. Because I think in this story, uh, it, it was much more important to be accurate than it was necessarily yes. first. You wanted to make sure that the news that you were getting was either coming from the Bills themselves uh, or from the NFL in the immediate aftermath. Uh, and then it was, you know, what did we, just trying to process what we had just seen uh, on the field unfold, which is something that, quite frankly, none of us in that press box had seen, and then trying to accurately describe that to readers uh, or to, you know, in this case, I've done several TV and, and radio interviews uh, to listeners to, to, you know, to give them a feel of what it was like to be in that stadium that night. Pull back a little bit, right? Because our team, we have NBC News, right? We, of course, and our viewers know we like to be transparent. We launched a ton of people on this story, of course. I mean, to, to Buffalo, to, Cle to Cincinnati, um, to wherever we needed to be. And one of the things that struck us and our team as we were getting ready to talk to you here was how much our team in Buffalo kept hearing about people about how much the city has gone through, right? Yeah. From the top shooting, the, her, the blizzard that was so deadly in Buffalo, then, you know, DeMar Hamlin, and yet the spirit of resilience in the city. You've worked for the Buffalo News 
not to age you here, but for, you know, 16 <laughs> years, right? I mean, what did this moment say to you? And how much does it mean that DeMar Hamlin is able to be there and give the heart hands emoji and, like, be out there tweeting about this? Well, listen, here in Western New York, we wear uh, that that blue collar sort of mentality on our sleeves. Right. And we are known uh, in Buffalo for being able to overcome and for, you know, listen, we're called the city of good neighbors and it's for a reason when there are. Uh, incidences like that snowstorm just around Christmas time that you mentioned, uh, the deadliest snowstorm in, in the history of our city. People came together. It's just what we do. And the Bills are such a fabric uh, of our community and the relationship that they have with the community and then that the community has with the team, I think has been mutually beneficial. And in a lot of ways, the Bills have been there to pick up people, right? They, they came down to Jefferson Avenue to the tops after the shooting to meet with fans and to meet with those who were grieving and to just provide a, a, a quick smile and, and some support in the way that they could. They've been a, a necessary distraction through so many things here in Buffalo. And the interesting thing about this DeMar Hamlin situation, I feel, is that I feel like the shoe has now been on the, uh, the other foot here a little bit where the community has in turn sort of picked up the team. Jay Skirsky of the Buffalo News. Um, I love that. I'm so glad for you to be able to be on here talking with us about it. And uh, so many people still thinking and praying for DeMar Hamlin. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Southeast Bureau, the University of Georgia Athletics organization says they are devastated after a football player and a staff member died in a car crash this weekend. Not long after the team celebrated its second straight national championship win, another player and another staff member were also hurt. Police are still investigating the cause of the crash. From our Midwest Bureau, a father in Indiana has been arrested after police say his toddler was seen on live TV holding a loaded gun. This is it. Neighbors told our Indianapolis affiliate that the child was waving the gun around, even at one point pulled the trigger, all of it captured on camera live because police in that city are featured on a Reels show called On Patrol Live. The dad is expected to be in court tomorrow. From our Western Bureau, a library in a Denver suburb closed so it could clean up a meth contamination. City officials said they only tested the library for meth because the same thing happened at one in Boulder last month. No word on when it'll reopen yet. Still to come, how a Miami neighborhood once known as the Harlem of the South is getting help and hoping to heal decades after a highway tore it apart. We'll be right back. On this Martin Luther King Day, we're taking a look at the push to revitalize a black community in Florida. In the 1950s, Overtown in Miami was known as the Harlem of the South. But the neighborhood was gutted when the interstate highway came to town, pushing out half the population in just 10 years. Now, the community is working on a new green space they hope could begin to heal over town. Guad Venegas has the story. When Bay Heinz was six, she swung from the branches of this banyan tree. She was surrounded by the vibrant center of Overtown Miami. Nobody locked their doors. We slept all night with our front doors open. Those Overtown memories the 84-year-old historian and writer grew up with are now a rarity. A predominantly black community known as the Harlem of the South that had a bustling downtown and nightlife rapidly became a ghost town largely because of a highway project. In 1955, President Eisenhower signed the Federal Aid Highway Act. Legislation would clear the way for the government to seize private property for public works projects. Around about 58 when they were getting ready to do the expressway. Some people already saw the handwriting on the wall and they started moving out. It was very bad. I don't know how else to tell you except that it was very bad. During the 1960s, Overtown lost more than half its population and a third of its businesses. Overtown was sacrificed for what the government determined was necessary progress. Decades later, an expansion to the highway that still looms above the neighborhood brings new hope to this historical part of town. So there's a lot kind of going on. 
to, uh, to explore. Jessica Goldman Strepnik and Trina Harris are part of the Underdecks Executive Committee. This group is working to create a green space under the construction of the new I-395, a $53 million investment to build the new urban landscape. It's going to be light, it's going to be airy, it's going to be full of, of landscaping and trees and, uh, and green, lots of green. You're going to have bike trails, you're going to have walking trails, you're going to have art and culture. A new use for an area overlooked for decades. I've experienced some pain walking under the underpath when it was dark, gloomy, and walking as a child. Our committee is working extremely hard to prevent negative experiences that have happened in this community under these underpaths. If approved, funding from the federal government could secure half the money needed. It would come from a billion dollar grant allocating funds to projects that reconnect communities torn apart by past federal infrastructure across the country. Derek Fleming co-owns the Red Rooster restaurant, which has been working hard to revitalize the rich history of the 1940s and 1950s. There was a time where people would flock here. Uh, they had to get to Overtown, particularly for a nightlife, but then we were cut off. And so this is an opportunity to reconnect, to not just allow folks to flow out, but folks to flow in, in a very holistic way. A new hope and a bright future for Overtown, no longer overlooked. Guad Venegas is joining us now. So Guad, you're talking with a lot of people about the project. How are they feeling about it? How are they feeling about what, what's going to happen down the road? Well, Hallie, people here are excited for any type of progress that will revitalize the community. It's been years since uh, private businesses and the city of Miami have tried uh, changing things here in Overtown. Now, the committee has met with members of the community to get their feedback. All of that went into a 400-page report that was turned into the city of Miami. They will now vote on it as they move forward uh, with this project. They have to secure the funding, and obviously they're also waiting for that federal funding to make this possible. They have some time because the highway expansion is still on their way so they would wait for that to be finished to finally begin with the construction of this green space Hallie Quad Venegas thank you very much for that reporting and for bringing us that important story that does it for us this hour more for you here tomorrow same time same place good to be with you coverage picks up right now thanks for watching our YouTube channel follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app